So hello and welcome to our second Public Affairs Series event of 2018. My name is Shannon Watson. I am the Director of Public Affairs at the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce. Most public policy proposals look simple from the outside, but are actually quite complicated to implement. Our topic for today is no exception. To be clear, this event is not advocating for or against any inquiries, nor are we setting up a two-sided debate. Because as you quickly find out when you are involved with this issue, there are not two sides. There are more like 14. I'm not kidding about that number. So instead of taking any of those sides, we are bringing together experts to talk about facts. One fact I know for sure is that this event could not happen without our sponsors. Our presenting sponsors are Goff Public and the University of St. Thomas. Our corporate sponsors are Comcast, Securian, and Seven Corners Print and Promo. Our contributing sponsors are AT&T, Clearway, Evergreen Energy St. Paul, Larson King, Malax Corporate Ventures, Minnesota Public Radio, PCL Construction, Platinum Bank, and Sunrise Banks. Please join me in giving our sponsors a round of applause. Now I would like to bring to the stage our host, Marcy McHenry, to say a few words on behalf of Midpoint Event Center. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for being here. As you can see, we're getting new neighbors. Yay. <laughs> and we're still here. Courtney, aren't we? Is Courtney here as well? Courtney. McDonald's? Yes. yes. And Midpoint yes. Event Center. We've survived so thus far. So. Um, I'm just happy that you're all here and excited for this great event. And that's all I have to say. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. Now I would like to welcome Elizabeth Emerson of Goff Public to introduce our speakers. Great. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I am Elizabeth Emerson. I'm the Director of Government Relations at Goff Public. We are a public relations and lobbying firm uh, located in Lower Town and soon to be moving to exciting Skyway Connected downtown St. Paul. So stay tuned for that and look for your invite to the party later. Um, I have the great pleasure of introducing our speakers. And about probably three weeks ago, I got to spend some time uh, with the St. Paul uh, Leadership St. Paul group. And we did an exercise uh, regarding the minimum wage. And you saw very, very quickly how hard, number one, uh, it was for people to kind of put themselves either in the space of a lawmaker's brain uh, and really pull out of their own self-interest when it comes to talking about uh, tough issues uh, such as the minimum wage. So I'm super excited for today's uh, event. So our speakers, Dr. Steve Hine. Dr. Hine has been with the Minnesota Department of Employment and Economic Development, or DEED, for over 20 years. Uh, he has been the research director in the Labor Market Information Office for over 15 years. And in this capacity, he and his staff of 50 are responsible for the production, analysis, and dissemination of official employment and unemployment statistics for the state of Minnesota. Dr. Hine also participates in numerous councils and work groups uh, with other states' LMI directors and officials with the U.S. Department of Labor's Bureau of Labor Statistics, and Employment and Training Administration. I don't know what the acronym for that is, but I'm sure there's a delightful one. Um, prior to his joining DEED, uh, Dr. Hine taught economics at colleges and universities in New York, Washington, Arkansas, and Minnesota. Our next speaker will be Pahua Yang Hoffman. Uh, Pahua joined the Citizens League in May 2014 to lead all of their efforts related to developing and, and advancing rec policy recommendations with the League's membership and partners. In December 2017, she became the seventh executive director of the Citizens League, and prior to her, to her joining the League, she served as the manager of government affairs and content administration with Twin Cities Public Television. For seven years, she led the station's government affairs and educated elected officials on TPD programs, as well as monitoring the thrilling policy challenges affecting public broadcasting. And last but certainly not least, Dr. Alan Bellis. Dr. Bellis has been a professor of economics in the College of Management at Metropolitan State University since 2004. His research and teaching focus on environmental economics, the economics of social issues, and enrollment forecasting for Metro State. Prior to his position there, uh, Dr. Bellis taught economics and statistics at the University of Washington and Seattle University. 
Now, with all of that, um, please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Steve Hine. Thank you very much. Um, uh, pleasure to be here to talk about this very, very important issue. Uh, good to see a lot of familiar faces in the crowd. Those, those of you that, that I'm familiar with or that are familiar with me, I hope um, that the expectation is not that I will come in here and be able to say definitively what the consequence, the impact would be of, uh, of the kind of minimum wage increases that are being deliberated. Uh, in fact, um, despite, I think, minimum wage being probably the, at least in the top three topics that have been researched by economists over the year, uh, the, the impact of minimum wage increases on things like employment, uh, income, benefit, uh, eligibility, and so on, uh, is still a, a, a hotly debated topic. There is really no uh, consensus, uh, it's still a lot of controversy over the uh, consequence of an increase in the minimum wage. Uh, if, if there were somewhat of a midpoint that I would uh, say characterizes much of the research and and, and discount some of the outliers. I think this quote from a recent letter to uh, Congress that was uh, sent in 2014 by over 600 economists, including, I think, eight Nobel Prize winners, uh, uh, stated that uh, increases in the minimum wage have had little or no negative effect on the employment of minimum wage workers. Uh, I, I think a lot of uh, uh, people, lay people perhaps, or people that haven't delved into the, the nature, both theoretical and empirical nature of minimum wage uh, and labor economics might be surprised by that. Uh, but, but generally speaking, I'd say that if there were a, uh, a point uh, estimate of the impact, it's, it's generally thought to be around uh, a point one, that is, a 10% increase in the minimum wage tends to reduce employment of minimum wage workers by about 1%. Here in Minnesota, we have about 250,000 minimum wage uh, workers in, in our economy. That's about one out of every eight, about 12% of our, uh, our workers are, are working at minimum wage. So if we were to increase that, the current minimum wage of $9.65 by, say, a dollar, roughly 10%, uh, we would expect to see a decrease in employment of about 2,500. Now, that's, that is not, again, uh, a point estimate that is without controversy. Um, and, and part of the reason uh, that this current environment is even more difficult to assess is that We've, we've, we don't have data, even in places like Seattle and San Francisco, where the implementation of a $15 minimum wage is, is somewhat ahead of, of the curve uh, elsewhere. Uh, we, we just don't have uh, evidence on the impact of a minimum wage increase of that magnitude and, and confined to uh, a city uh, in those cases with uh, easily uh, accessible jobs via commuters from outside the region. So um, the bottom line is that if anybody tells you they know that the impact is going to be such and such, they are lying to you. <laughs> you know, there's just, there, there's, there is no consensus, uh, uh, you know, other than to say that most studies and at least these 600 economists, very prominent economists, uh, would argue that the evidence would suggest that there's relatively little impact on employment of minimum wage workers. Now that catches a lot of people by surprise. Like I say, you know, the, the, the title of the session here is Minimum Wage 101. Uh, Econ 101, you might learn about supply and demand and the impact that price floors have and, and uh, uh, you, you know, the, the, the bottom line of that kind of 101 level analysis of a price floor, which is what a minimum wage is, uh, would be to say that the quantity 
uh, demanded of whatever it is that's uh, being regulated in this respect is going to go down. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the theoretical underpinnings, though, of the more recent, um, and, and I say recent, but this is 30 uh, years or more uh, ago, uh, is, is somewhat more nuanced than that 101 understanding. Uh, in particular, I'll, I'll point to uh, a paper that was published in the mid-1980s by two prominent economists whose names you might recognize, George Akerlof and Janet Yellen, who happen to be husband and wife. Janet Yellen, you might recognize as being the, the recently uh, let go Federal Reserve Chair. <laughs> All right, uh, and George Akerlof is one of those Nobel Prize winning economists that signed this argument. In, in any case, the, the, the argument that they put forward at that time was that, uh, you know, people are not like, I, I call it widgets here. Uh, um, you know, are not some sort of commodity that there may be uh, other impacts that an increase in the minimum wage might have. And in particular, uh, their argument is that the greater is the gap between the wage at which you're indifferent between working or not, that is, you don't really care if you lose your job because it pays such a low wage anyways, you'd perhaps just as soon uh, look for another job or, or stay at home. Uh, the bigger is the gap between what you're earning and that so-called reservation wage is, is an incentive for you to make sure that you don't get, go, don't get fired, okay? Um, you know, so, so a worker that is paid at a, at a relatively higher wage is going to put forth more effort, uh, will have higher morale, will like his job, will be more loyal to the employer, and, and so on. And so the argument there goes that the higher is the wage, the more productive is going to be the worker, and therefore uh, employers that do uh, pay a higher minimum wage or a higher wage in general will find that their profit margins are sustained. Uh, they won't have to lay off those workers because they're more productive by virtue of that, that higher wage. Uh, an, another uh, the, uh, uh, introduction into the theory behind minimum wages that, that is often related to this notion of what, what Akerlof and Yellen called efficiency wages is the fact that uh, the transaction costs, the turnover costs, the costs associated with foregone output uh, when uh, uh, an employee leaves their job, uh, the costs associated with recruiting, hiring, and training an, a replacement worker are pretty substantial. Um, there, there are estimates all over the map in this regard, you know, depending on the nature of the job and so on and so forth. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's often estimated that the costs of replacing a worker that leaves is, is somewhere between, let's say, 50% and about 200% of the annual salary that that worker earns. So, you know, that's not... It's not really crucial that we have a good point estimate. The point being that turnover costs are very uh, um, high in, in many occupations, even in those that might pay minimum wage. So uh, by virtue of, say, per, perhaps paying a, a, an efficiency wage rather than a, than a uh, market clearing wage and, and linked with these high transaction costs, uh, we can again see that higher minimum wages may insulate uh, uh, many employers from uh, what I think at first blush strikes many people as being detrimental to that uh, firm's profit margins. So I, 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 I couldn't come up here and, and then leave without throwing some data up. <laughs> That's my... Um, I, I do want to point out that based on uh, current population survey, most recent data available to us on the characteristics of minimum wage workers, here in Minnesota, uh, nearly half of minimum wage workers are 25 or above. 60% uh, of them are female. Uh, a third of them are working full time. And, and nearly 60%, in fact, have some college in their educational background, at least some college. And again, nearly a third of them are married with the spouse present. And although the data don't say this, 
I got to suspect that in many of those instances, there's kids involved too, hungry mouths to feed. Okay, so, so it is the case here in Minnesota and, and elsewhere, but here in Minnesota, that uh, uh, we often see individuals that are older, more educated, married, uh, and, and working, earning the minimum wage. <clears throat> I guess the point is it's, it's not just the high school kid, you know, flipping burgers during the summer that uh, are, are earning this minimum wage. Uh, and then uh, lastly, I, I do want to show that, uh, first of all, the, the minimum wage in real terms here, nationwide anyways, peaked in 1968. It's fallen since then. It, you know, kind of a sawtooth pattern as new uh, minim, minimums are implemented and then they uh, depreciate over time with increases in the cost of living. Um, but uh, although our real minimum wage is less than it was in 1968, the productivity of workers has more than doubled in, uh, in that same time period. If, if, if the minimum wage had kept up with productivity growth uh, since 1968, as it had been pr pretty closely throughout the years before 1968, the minimum wage today would be about $20, just shy of $20. Um, as a consequence, we, we really do see minimum wage workers, including those older, married, educated, working individuals, uh, struggling to make ends meet, uh, much more so than they have in the past. Uh, one of the uh, data tools that we have on our website is a, uh, a pretty comprehensive collection of data from all sorts of sources that we use to estimate what it would take in terms of an hourly wage rate under different family configurations to meet a basic, no frills, standard of living budget. Uh, if you're single, no kids, and you work full time, you'd have to make $15.31. So the new minimum wage would just about allow a, a, a single person with no other obligations uh, to feed, house, and, and clothe themselves. If you start to look at uh, um, partnered couples with a, with a kid, uh, and if two of them are working full time, uh, they'd each have to earn $16.89. Now, if you start looking at single uh, parents, for example, a, a, a single parent with one child that's working full time, they'd have to make nearly $29, okay? So I, I think we, we need to recognize that any minimum wage or any wage that an individual earns that falls short of this, this is for Ramsey County, um, is out of necessity then going to fail to meet that basic uh, standard of living that we've defined for this purpose so, and or rely on, uh, um, on income support programs of various types. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Paul Hua. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Pahua Hoffman, and I get the honor and privilege of working for this great organization called the Citizens League. And one of the reasons, in part, that I accepted the role of uh, policy director when I joined the organization three years ago was this beautiful uh, guiding operating principle that those who are most impacted by an issue should be part of defining that issue and being a part of uh, the solution. And this is what guides our work, it's what guides me, and it's what guided, has guided this uh, project on the minimum wage. The Citizens League does our work in a number of ways, but one of the ways that we do, that we do our work is through the convening of task forces and study committees to take on an issue and to study it, and um, by organizing a table of stakeholders that reflect different um, perspectives, different opinions, um, and in this case, I hope, different um, 
stakeholders representing businesses, industries, and sectors, um, including members of the public, to come together to see what um, we could come uh, together to solve that we can't do alone. And so when the St. Paul Foundation um, sought us out and asked the Citizens League if it would help the city of St. Paul have conversations around the minimum wage, we decided that instead of going right into a six-month study committee, which is our typical timeline these days, that, in first, that first we'd like to um, carve out two months, or so two and a half months, to just listen. And so you've heard from Dr. Hines. It, he's laid out some data for you. And we believe at the Citizens League, technical data is important. But just as important is the contextual storytelling of how these policies um, might impact people in our community. Um, representing, in this room I know many of you are business owners, but workers, um, residents of all ages, um, different communities here in St. Paul. And so I spent the better part of two and a half months interviewing about, I can't remember what my report says, 237 uh, people. I personally conducted all those interviews. Um, I went through every online submission that came through the anonymous portal, and I also collected the email submissions. And what I learned, does, ha, just a show of hands, how many people have read the Citizens League Minimum Wage Report? That's awesome. <clears throat> Before I go into how I organize the report, I'm just going to give a little bit of St. Paul data as background. Because I know, Dr. Hein, your, your data cover much of the state. I'm just going to drill down a little bit for the city of St. Paul. So one of the um, really compelling data for us um, when we took a look at the memo that was produced by um, Thomas Durfee, a student at the University of Minnesota um, Economics Department. His work covers several pages in our report in the beginning. We had asked him to help us uh, provide some technical data to set, the, um, to set the conversations that I would be having with um, people on the community. And I'm trying to find here the specific uh, number. I believe St. Paul leads currently um, percentage-wise uh, in number of people living in poverty. I believe it's 40% in the report. And that's followed by Brooklyn Center. And so this is just backdrop for you um, to consider as we think about what is the problem we're trying to solve. Because we've heard from many people that that is the number one problem that we're trying to solve. Yet, when we talk to individuals, um, in the community representing the various businesses and sectors, um, they also ask that same question whether the minimum wage alone would do that. So how I organize a report is um, I, rep I organize a report according to um, the individuals I sp spoke to, and it breaks it down into 11 sections. And I first covered, it's, out, it's organized in alphabetical order, and I first um, organized it by day training, employment, and services with people with disabilities. And I know that um, Lith and Bob Brick are here in the audience. Um, they helped to inform this section. And do many people know about the adult training program for people with disabilities, other than these two that I mentioned? So these are one of the things that we've learned that makes the, the task at hand about what the minimum wage ordinance ought to look like in the city of St. Paul really challenging. Here are these groups of people um, who represent nonprofits who are trying to provide employment services for people with disabilities. And um, right now, currently, Department of Labor allows a um, special minimum wage um, that makes that provides uh, opportunities for people with disabilities to have a competitive edge when um, competing for jobs in the workforce. And should the minimum wage increase, it really puts pressure on these organizations whether or not they can provide such services in the community. 
We also talk to um, home health care workers who are providing much needed services uh, to people in our community, uh, older adults, uh, people with disabilities. And these are positions, I would say, that should be high wage model jobs, but um, currently they are not seen as um, jobs that people hold in high regard. And so currently, right now, the Medicaid reimbursement rate is $17.40. And so the people providing employment um, for these positions are concerned that if the city were to increase the minimum wage to 15, without also raising the Medicaid reimbursement rate, they're not sure how they can stay in business. Um, we've heard a lot, probably the, the folks I've heard from the most are restaurant owners and restaurant workers. The tip credit, no tip credit, um, is probably one of the better well-documented debates um, currently in, if you read the, the, any of the local newspapers, you will see that this is a well-covered topic. Um, still, it remains one, I think, um, for the Saint, city of St. Paul to consider. Uh, we have restaurant workers who are asking for a one fair wage that tip not be included as part of that wage. Um, they feel this will close the gap between uh, front of house workers, those in the dining room, and the back of house workers, those in the kitchen. Um, there are some restaurant um, workers who are not making $15 an hour with tips. So think about your quick service um, restaurants, your counter service, your baristas, etc. There was one evening I spent at um, Sweeney's where there were 70 uh, restaurant workers, mainly, um, very few owners, restaurant workers, who demanded that they not get a minimum wage increase. I had never seen that before. So they were asking to not get a minimum wage increase because according to them, they were already making, uh, many in the room um, cited the amounts 30 and $40 an hour already with their tips included. And their concerns mainly rest on if they were pay, being paid $15 minimum wage, in addition to their tips, um, there wouldn't be, their employers may not have the necessary funds to pay their back of house workers. And so they're saying, don't give me any more money. Um, allow my employer to have that money to pay the back of house, because they are not getting tipped. And so these are two that, um, just two, um, Perspectives and Shannon's right. I think there are, are as many as 14 perhaps more and so it is really difficult um, I think a difficult task ahead of us and for the city of st. Paul as they think about what an ordinance might look like and what should be in the what what are the components that should be in the ordinance for the city of st. Paul um, I'll just talk a little bit about low-wage workers just in general uh, for a moment I mentioned this at a recent city council meeting about retell the story, and it's in the report. Um, there was an advocacy group called C Tool who organized an interview for me with a low wage worker. Um, speaking through an interpreter, this low wage worker told me that uh, she started working for a contract cleaning company uh, 14 years ago. At that time, she was making $7.25. Fourteen years later, she currently makes $10.75. She doesn't think she's going to see $15 unless there is a mandate, because she's easily replaced, she's low skilled, and the cleaning companies, or the contract cleaning companies, it is in their best interest to keep and to hire the lowest paid workers, because this is what gives them a competitive edge when they're bidding to clean big retailers in our city. And so I just give you these different perspectives where um, I think it's easy to um, find one story. I know certainly you could always tell who I last talked to because everyone's story was really compelling. Um, 
I would leave an advocacy meeting or a meeting with a labor union, meeting with a low wage worker, and there's, that is that person's lived experience. It is what is impacting them. It is a real experience. And then you meet um, workers who are asking to not be paid any more than what they're making right now. And how does a city come together to find what's right and to find what's appropriate and while meeting the needs of its community? And so um, I've delivered my report on the 16th of this month. And in a couple weeks, I hope to be invited back by the city council and have representatives from the mayor's office so that we can talk about what a um, longer phase two might include in a formal study committee where we might bring maybe even some members here from this room to be part of that work so that we can come together and form um, an ordinance for St. Paul that um, is responsive to the needs in our community. Thank you. Um, if I could have the next presentation, Amanda. Oh, just keep clicking. Well, that's awful fancy. Thank you. Um, there we go. So I'll get this adjusted. I'm Alan Bells from Metropolitan State University. Um, I'm going to talk about the benefits cliff. What is it and what can be done about it and how does it fit into the context of a minimum wage increase? Uh, first, the standard academic disclaimer. These are my opinions and certainly not those of Metro State unless they are, but they probably aren't. Uh, the second disclaimer, I am an economist. That means that there will be graphs, uh, no supply and demand, uh, and I also will make a small policy recommendation just because that's what we do. So first, the benefits cliff. The benefits cliff is this phenomenon where when you have social welfare programs, those are naturally intended to help low-income households, help low-income families to alleviate the impacts of poverty because poverty is a bad thing in a society. Now, because those help low-income families, as families earn more income, those benefits go away. The paradox is that the erosion of those benefits as you earn more income probably reduces or eliminates the incentive to go out and take a job, take a job that's dangerous, take a job that's exhausting, take a job that's dirty. Um, and so it's tough to balance out the desire to alleviate poverty with the potential for this disincentive to get people working. So how do benefits change as income rise? Um, some benefits are reduced gradually. So uh, if you look at child care assistance, assistance for working parents who have children, child care co-pays under uh, child care assistance increases as, a family in, as family income increases. So the more you make, the more you have to pay for your child care. That seems reasonable. And actually the increase, uh, as I looked at some of the numbers, wasn't that much. It was, a, it was a equivalent to about 1.5% <clears throat> of the income increase. Roughly equivalent, to put it in other terms, is a 1.5% tax. So as your income increases by a dollar, you lose 1.5 cents in childcare credits. That seems reasonable. There are other programs that similarly are, the, the benefits slowly go away as a family makes more money. Um, one of those is the Minnesota Public Housing Authority's housing assistance. So the statement of how housing assistance works is families contribute no more than 30% of their income toward their rent. And, and that seems reasonable. That's, you know, you wouldn't want a family to use more than that to purchase housing because they need to get other things. But the implication of that is that if a family makes an extra dollar in income, 30% of their housing subsidy goes away. They lose 30 cents in terms of their housing subsidy. That is equivalent in terms of the incentive to work of a 30% tax which um, was roughly what the capital gains, or I'm sorry, uh, corporate income tax was before the change. So that's a 30% tax. Hold on to that. Uh, temporary assistance for needy families, benefits are calculated based on family size and income, with half of an individual's gross earned income and all of any unearned income, such as unemployment benefits, deducted from the maximum TANF award amount. 
So as you earn an extra dollar, 50 cents in TANF benefits goes away, a 50% tax on earnings. So if you put just those two together, that's an 80% tax on any income that a low-income family manages to go out and earn. 80% tax. It's a pretty big impact. Um, <clears throat> there's another way in which benefits go away. Sometimes there's a threshold. And when a family's income gets to a threshold, those benefits disappear abruptly. Um, so in 2017, Medicaid eligibility for a family of three ended at about $28,000 in annual income, if I'm reading the literature right. That means you earn up to $27,500, your family's fine. You earn an extra $1,000, and you suffer this really big loss in terms of benefits. And if you're concerned about your family having health insurance, you have to go out and purchase that health insurance, and that, that's a big hit to what your family has available to spend on other things. Um, for states not adopting the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, uh, Medicaid and CHIP created two cliffs, one when the parents lose health benefits and the other when the kids lose them. Um, and it might not be eligibility, it might be priority. The Seattle Housing Authority prioritizes access to public housing for very low income families. And there's a threshold for that. Um, it would, this is telling. Seattle Housing Authority gives preference to homeless families and those who are extremely low income defined as earning 30% or less of the area median. And that'll come back a little bit later too because very often eligibility for benefits depends upon the median income in the area, 50%. How big ultimately is the disincentive when you put it together for a typical low-income family? Well, this was a, a paper published in 2002, which means the research was probably done in the year 2000 or thereabouts, from uh, the Journal of Policy Analysis and Management, which I have a very special relationship with. It's a very well-respected academic journal. And an article on the, on the benefits cliff there said estimates of Okay, I'll apologize for what my fellow economists have written here. We'll get through it and then we'll get the punchline. Estimate of fixed effects regressions of income that control for both observable and unobservable time invariant characteristics. Trust me, it's all legitimate boilerplate. Uh, show that monthly net income increases by $2.63 for every additional hour of work effort. $2.63 per hour. That's what a low-income family gets for working after the benefits are taken away. That was back in about 2000, not that long ago. So that's an incentive of, of uh, that's an idea of how big this effect is. Now, what does this look like? And I, there's a graph up here. I apologize for the graph, but I hope you can see it because it really illustrates what this looks like for a low-income family. So you can see as they start out at zero income, um, their net family resources increases sort of at a 45 degree, sort of linearly. So for that first $7,000 or so, it seems like a family gets to keep what they, what they earn. Then it flattens out. And that's as um, some of those uh, uh, gradual reductions in benefits kick in. So as the family earns more, their available resources don't increase very much. And then there's a cliff. Um, I believe that cliff was with SNAP benefits, supple Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Programs benefits, went away dramatically. And then there's another plateau, an area where the family works more, but, but, but um, benefits are sort of gradually eroded so that they don't get any better off. And then there's a second cliff, which is where the parents lose Medicaid. And then there's a third cliff, which is where the kids lose Medicaid. And then, um, and then it starts to go up again, because at that point, they're sort of done with all of the public assistance programs. They're beyond the limits. And so now they're earning a dollar per dollar in terms of what, what, they make, um, what they make in the labor market. Now, I was asked when I put this together if I could come up with a good illustrative example for Minnesota in 2018. And I tried. I went and I looked at descriptions of some of these benefits programs, but there's a lot of programs. Eligibility and payment amounts are tremendously variable based upon the situation. I got this from the National Center for Children in Poverty at Columbia University, and they created some calculators that generate graphs like this. 
Uh, none of them were from Minnesota, and none of them were from current times. They're a little bit old, but this gives you a sense of what that looks like for a family. Sometimes you work and you get nothing. Sometimes you work and a major, major important benefit upon which you're relying goes away, and then you have to figure out what you're going to do. So there's a disincentive, and you need to be careful. Why should business owners care? Um, you have employees. And if you're like me as a professor, I like it when my students show up, mostly because it feeds my ego. You like it when your employees show up because that's necessary to make a business run. My students miss class because they get sick, because their kids get sick, because they have crises at home. If you want employees coming to work, the more stable their home life is, I suspect, the more likely they are to show up at work, to be able to concentrate and focus on the work that they're doing while they're there. Benefits programs, however you might feel about them, help that happen. They help employees have more stable home lives so that they can get to work and they can focus on work when they're there. And that's completely aside from any altruism that you might feel towards, towards low-income working people. But this is about the minimum wage. And what does this have to do about the minimum wage? Well, first, an increased minimum wage accelerates the rate at which employees approach this clip. I've heard anecdotally that, that low-income workers who have public assistance benefits at home, they know when those benefits will run out. They know where the cliffs are. And so they have a very good sense of how many hours they can work before their family's in danger of falling off that cliff. As minimum wages increase, that's going to introduce some uncertainty. That's going to make that calculation different than it was the previous year. And you could wind up with some employees going over the cliff without really expecting that that would happen. In addition, I mentioned that benefits limits are tied to median income in the area. So there's the potential that median income could change as a result of changes in the minimum wage. It might go up if the minimum wage helps low-income people. It might go down if a lot of them wind up losing their jobs, but it could change. Um, will it really change median income? No, probably not. Median income in St. Paul is about $53,000 a year, ballpark. That requires two adults in a household working full-time at minimum wage. In a year, that would be $40,000 at $10 an hour. If it goes up to fifteen, dollars that would be $60,000 an hour. So it's not likely to change the median, so that's just there as an excuse to tie this in with the minimum wage. But the acceleration in terms of hours, how many hours you work, and going off a cliff, that's a real concern. So I said there was going to be a policy idea, a policy prescription. Um, there's lots of big ones. They're not going to happen. We're not going to change how public assistance programs work. That's a bigger discussion for other people. But what the St. Paul Area Chamber of Commerce might advocate for or try to sponsor is the production of a graph like this, a current one for the Twin Cities metropolitan area. Um, so again, this came from the National Center for Children in Poverty, and I was interested in learning more, so I went there. I found this calculator, and I made up an imaginary family. Single parent, two kids who were, I think, age three and six. The family was on a variety of programs, had some assets, and I went through it, filled in the information. It was fairly straightforward, and this is what it gave me. It told me for my imaginary family where the cliffs would be, what sort of return I would get from working in different income ranges, and basically what my picture looked like. So there's that. It's a simulator. It takes family information and creates the benefits cliff graph. Um, if we could create one of these, and I'll talk about that in a minute, for Minnesota, for the current year, for ongoing years, updated on an annual basis, employees would know where their cliffs are. It's very complicated. There are lots of programs, lots of different family characteristics that impact benefits in different ways. But if you could create the tool, give people access to it, they would know what this looks like for them. That would let them make informed decisions about how much to work, so that their home lives remain as stable and as well supported as possible. 
Again, a current provision, version of this for Minnesota doesn't exist, but it might be a valuable tool for our community. Who's going to bell the cat? That's the tricky part. Um, I tried to get in touch with the Department of Social Work, and nobody got back to me. I tried to get in touch with the National Center for Children in Poverty, and they haven't gotten back to me either. Um, it might involve hiring some folks who know about social work, who know about benefit programs for a few hours, getting them to do some coding maybe. Uh, social workers mostly are not in it for the money. And I think if you could convince uh, folks in an academic social work department that this was going to be beneficial, they might jump on it. It might be a good project for students in a master's level class. And it's a worthwhile project. This is going to help low-income working people in our community. And that's something that, that's, that's, that's hard to not get behind. Another thought as to who could do it um, was the Wilder Foundation or Wilder Research. This seems like it's very much in their ballpark and might be a worthwhile organization to contact if the, the Chamber of Commerce is interested in that. So in conclusion, we have a current system of social insurance that's well-meaning. It's meant to help low-income families. It's meant to support them. And it's compassionate. And we don't want to have Dickensian-style poverty in the Twin Cities in the early 21st century. But it provides this disincentive. There's an opportunity for people in the state to help low-income people figure out where the pitfalls are, where the cliffs are, so that they can do as well as they can for their families. I think that's a value that we all share. And um, this is one potential opportunity to make that happen and to avoid, again, a potential downside of an increase in the minimum wage, which is well-meaning, but could fling low-income working people headlong toward these benefits cliffs. Um, that's what I have for you. Thank you. You guys, this microphone to pass around. Oh. Hello? All right, I'm going to follow the model of esteemed, <laughs> Peter knows what I'm talking about, of esteemed moderators that have come before me. You can ask your question, I hold the microphone. I already <laughs> see the first question over here. So I have two comments. One would be as an employer, the conversation about wages is different than compensation overall. So you can set someone at a wage of $12 an hour, but it doesn't include health insurance, PTO, bonuses, upward income mobility. So when we're thinking about wages, we're not thinking comprehensively about what total compensation really means, just to know. Second point, I was interviewed for the Citizens League for this study. And I came at it as a St. Paul resident who really wants to combat poverty. But when we look at St. Paul, we need to look at the number of people who are out of the workforce but who live in St. Paul. So if we look at the prime age labor statistics, 20 to 54, you have 30,000 residents who aren't in the workforce in St. Paul. Is there a question that goes along with that? The question here. The question here is when you have a number of 30,000 outside of the smaller number that would potentially be impacted by minimum wage increase, is this really going to affect poverty? Thanks. <laughs> there are a lot of reasons that, that, that prime working age individuals may not be in the workplace. Um, you know, being in school. Uh, having family obligations. Uh, a, a lot of that uh, number, in fact, we, we look at the, the data that asks, not only are you in or out of the workforce, but do you want a job if, if one were available for you? Uh, most of these non-participants, in fact, are voluntarily out of the workforce. We can all imagine neighbors, perhaps, in St. Paul, who's, you know, got a stay-at-home parent or somebody with a, a disability that precludes them from working or 
or what have you. Uh, Minnesota and, and the Twin Cities in particular is renowned for its very high participation rates. Uh, we, we have uh, among the highest, if not the highest, in, in the nation statewide. And the Twin Cities is the big driver behind that. So I, I, to my mind, I don't see non-participation as much as a problem as I think it presents as an opportunity, especially in the years ahead when workers are going to be increasingly more difficult to find. And to the extent that we might identify barriers to participation, um, you know, oftentimes that, that involves childcare resources or flexibility uh, in terms of work schedules and, and the like. Um, uh, you know, I, I do think there's an opportunity there to uh, ameliorate the impact of what is going to be a really difficult environment for employers looking for workers in the, in the years ahead. Um, but I, I don't see that as a, as a, a real significant issue here, if I'm understanding your question properly. Uh, I, I do readily acknowledge that there's more to a, uh, a wage bill than just you know, the hourly wage that, that is paid to an individual. And I think, you know, we're all well aware that there's an ongoing debate around how to uh, provide affordable health care to, to our population. And much of that is through employer provided benefits. Anything to add? I'll just add that uh, some of the things that came up in the interviews, and, and Dylan, I appreciate your question. And I think some of the responses that we heard from workers or, or potential workers is that, yes, the wage matters, but also I need better transportation, I need childcare, and that there are other barriers keeping them from, um, from work. And so many of our low wage workers, some of whom I spoke to, mentioned that the wage is just one piece in that mix for them is it's having a transit system that works for them, um, finding readily available childcare that's inexpensive. Um, and I don't know that that gets directly to your question, Dylan, but I, I just know that overall that is, those are some of the barriers, including is this job at its current wage worth it for me to go out when I have all these other barriers in front of me? Um, I've had the benefit of time to think while they were talking, uh, so I'll offer what I can. Um, economists always like to talk about being aware of unintended consequences, and I think you highlighted two of them. One is that if people are working for minimum wage and getting benefits, the opportunity cost of the increase in the wage might be some of those benefits going away. Um, there is the impact on folks who aren't in the labor market and maybe rely on other people to do services for them. And that is a, a, a potential downside in all honesty. I haven't heard discussed all that much, but it, it's probably come up in the discussion. I would hope that it has. So I think those are good, good valid points. Okay, right here. Uh, thank you. Um, Steve referenced the number of <coughs> statistics of Ramsey County uh, in terms of low income wages. And I, I think I got this correct in looking at the um, release by the Citizens League that. Um, for people making less than eight hundred dollars full time, it's like sixteen percent, I believe, is the number. But if that's a base to start with, other things that I would be interested in having built into that would be uh, how many of those people are in multiple family incomes, have multiple family incomes, to address a total number. There is the issue that Alan brought up about net family resources, which would be. Um, income programs and have those built in. And, and also related to that, I would, if there was some way of knowing how many of these people um, over time would be moving out of that. In other words, they, they might make advancements in their jobs. So that I'm assuming it's not a static number over time. Maybe some of those things were addressed, but hopefully they would emerge in further work. Was that a question about phase two? I, yeah, I just, I, I just opened it up. I don't see if you could address well, that. I, th those, are, those are interesting points that unfortunately the data that we have available uh, don't allow us to address. We, we, we have data on, on every individual that's out there working for somebody, including their hourly wage rate. 
Uh, we don't know what their family composition is. We don't, you know, we don't know those kinds of things. Uh, I will say that, the, you know, in Ramsey County, I just looked up the Ramsey County data on our website before I came. <laughs> uh, but uh, we, have, we have about 330,000 jobs here in Ramsey County. 30 to 33 percent, depending on the time of year, of those jobs pay $15 an hour or less. Uh, you know, so, so the, the uh, <laughs> prevalence of, of pay in that range or below that, that threshold would suggest that we've got many different types of family compositions underlying that. I, you know, I, the slide that I showed there that demonstrates that there's a significant share of minimum wage workers that are uh, of a demographic that may not come to mind when one thinks of a minimum wage worker, uh, uh, you know, I think does also suggest that we've got a lot of individuals that are uh, of very, very diverse backgrounds in, in terms of their things like family composition and, and so on. Can I pose this question? Well, since we sort of alluded to it a little bit, Pahua, can you talk about um, what the what the phase two option is, or is it is it yet? I know that there's a desire by the council and the mayor's office to have a phase two. I don't know what that looks like yet. They're still digging into the current report that I uh, distributed, and we're supposed to get staff together soon to come up with the scope of work for phase two. Thank you. Do I get hold of it or no? No. Okay. I'm just curious what the three of you would say to a, a business owner who has taken uh, significant personal risk and capital risk to uh, to begin a, a business who has no capacity to absorb uh, a wage increase or an expense increase such as you're describing, especially if their physical location is near a border where there's a discrepancy in wages. Um, what would you say to them? What I, what I tried to convey in my comments was that I think we have to be a little bit more, uh, I, I guess, less, less anxious to jump to the conclusion that if I have to raise the wage I pay my workers from, from 12 to 15, that that's a $3 an hour loss to my profit margin. I, I think the empirical evidence that there are minimal, if any, negative impacts on employment and the, the broad acceptance of uh, these explanations around the response of employees to uh, increasing wages would, would, I guess, urge me to caution you against necessarily jumping to that conclusion. Uh, we've had a, a couple of local examples of, of businesses that have unilaterally raised their, their wage in, in recent years, and uh, to, to my knowledge, they're all in business. <laughs> um, you know, so, so I think both the empirical and theoretical work in labor economics around minimum wage uh, uh, suggests that 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 conclusion that well I've got to absorb this additional cost and it's going to cut into my profits and I'm going to have to lay off people uh, isn't borne out by the data. All I can tell you is that I've heard from many small businesses during my interview process and that I hear you and that um, many of the small businesses I've heard are not in a position to be able to absorb any more um, increases in costs. So for example, um, in my report, I talked to two, two local book uh, store owners. They talked about how their, their product, right, the very items that they're selling are, that the prices are dictated by their publisher. Everyone wants a local bookstore on their street. Um, and she's like, try running one, right? So she's thinking about how am I gonna make this work? I either have to reduce staff, reduce hours, or both. Reduce turnover. 
Or we're just, what did you say? <laughs> we're just two number? So when you think about a business like that, or I know that Courtney's in the room and I talked to some other franchise owners, again, there too, their prices are dictated. They're set at the national level. Where does one, where does a business owner go um, to absorb that increase in labor costs? And we're talking a big jump um, if it does go to 15. Um, and so I, I, I did my best to document all the, the kind of pain points for small businesses and businesses of really of all sizes because I think the, the, the chapter that I wrote about the, um, the small business section talks about how for some, for most business owners, they've been feeling the pressure and they've been absorbing for the last four or five years. Uh, for businesses who are about 50 or more employees, they said first was the Affordable Care Act and then health insurance requirement. Then came the that same year, the state increased its minimum wage. There was a 14, 15, 16 phase in period. Then there was um, earned sick and safe time. Uh, and then now the minimum wage. So they said we've been hit at the federal, state, city level, and this is all within four years. And so, you know, one of the things I said at the city council meeting is that for us, who may not be business owners, four or five years seems like a long time ago for small businesses and business owners, this was just yesterday. We're, we're just still trying to make it work now. And for the city to consider a minimum wage increase without really fully understanding all the pain points uh, from the business owner perspective is um, for them a little short-sighted. And so one of my efforts and hopefully uh, we get enough, we get some, some business owner representatives in a possible phase two so that they can have a hand in helping shape what that ordinance looks like. So that it is responsive to the needs of, uh, of the business community. And all I'd add to that is that that sounds like a very good argument for having this discussion about a minimum wage at a state level rather than a local level so that you don't have these near boundary impacts that you described. Okay, we've got time for one more question. This is my boss, I'll hand him the microphone. <laughs> that was a great dovetail for my question, which specifically was about this idea about state level laws in the area of wages. Um, can you speak to this idea about serving the least skilled and the most needy in a city level wage increase. For example, if I have a chain and I'm right on the border of St. Paul and Roseville and I raise my wages at $15, the Roseville employee is gonna leave that chain and come work for me. And I'm gonna hire the more skilled laborer and if that person has more skill than the least skilled, most needy person on my staff and I no longer can have two people that St. Paul resident will not benefit from because if, if we're dealing with local wage increases, you're gonna have people coming in from the suburbs to work there and the most needy people in this community still won't be represented. Do you see that as a potential, a real potential risk? I'll start because they took the heat the first time. Um, yes, and when I teach students about minimum wages and other sorts of, of price regulations like that, one of the unintended consequences that comes out is that with a higher minimum wage, employers can be much more selective about who they hire. And the usual story, and again, it, it's tough to bear this out in, in statistical research, but the usual story is that a minimum wage will help people who have been working for minimum wage but are sort of at the top of that um, at the top of that in terms of experience or skills or any of the characteristics that nefarious employers might look for in the people that they hire. Um, and so that is a potential downside. It could be that the people that are really um, kind of at the bottom of the labor market, and I, I don't mean to be judgmental or anything like that, but the people with a few skills, the people with the less experience, the people with um, uh, difficult backgrounds might be the first ones to go and they might be replaced by people who have more skills, more experience, and less questionable backgrounds. And that's sort of a standard um, 
that's a standard potential unintended consequence of a, a higher minimum wage. I'll just add and say that I've had, I've talked to employers who said that is exactly where they'll go. Um, currently, we have a, a, there's a small business who's currently hiring um, people coming out of the correction system, who may be coming out of recovery. They're taking a chance on that person to help them rebuild their life. And they said at, at the minimum wage which increase possibly to 15, they're not sure they're gonna be able to provide those opportunities. So that's, a, that's something that this employer is doing right now. So it's not a theoretical what if, but they are doing this right now. And they're saying, I don't know that I can continue to do that at this rate that we're discussing. So it is something certainly to think about. Okay, so this is this is a little bit of a sort of downer room, and I realized it's because our social media manager texted me and she said, nobody's tweeting. And I'm like, well, it, it's serious. We're, we're doing this. And I forgot to remind you guys to tweet. Anyways, um, I do want to really, really thank our presenters um, for giving us some really good information that, in my mind, I'm not getting anywhere else. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank our sponsors for giving us the ability to have these conversations. And I want to thank every single person in this room who took an hour and a half plus travel time out of their day to look at a really complicated, really sort of unsexy issue that has enormous implications for our community and our, our employer community as well. So thank you to everybody and have a great afternoon.